Hello, I'm Dr. Mary Meehan. As a Catholic university, Seton Hall University is committed to supporting educational achievement within our community. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Investors Bank, Seton Hall University, where leaders learn, PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, Hackensack Meridian Health, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, and by the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Insurance fraud costs New Jersey families $1,300 a year. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by JerseyBites.com. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Wow. Uh, that was, and this is, Yeston Davis, a counter tenor who is performing here in Farinelli and the King, playing over at the uh, Velasco Theater on West 44th Street. Wow. Thank you. Describe what a counter tenor is. In its simplest form, it's male falsetto. But male falsetto is used by lots of singers and not always all the time. So you might hear a pop singer who sings in their falsetto range right at the top to achieve a, an effect uh, or at some different colour, whereas what I do is sing all the time in my falsetto range. And I suppose most of the stuff I do is opera or classical concerts. I'm singing repertoire that would have been sung by the castrati in the 18th century. So lots mm. of Handel opera was written for men who unfortunately were castrated deliberately in order to preserve their high voice, but then their body sort of went a bit crazy and they had this power of a, of a <clears throat> tenor, let's say, um, but with a, a treble tone. And so their range matches what we, we can sing as, as countertenors today. Your voice, when yeah. did you know that this would be the range that you would have, or did you? I, it was something that crept up on me. I'd sung as a boy, so I'd had that feeling of what it's Where? like to perform. In a choir in Cambridge, um, in Cambridge University, they have chapel choirs, and I was at St John's College, Cambridge. And I did that for six years. And then your voice breaks, and I fumbled around singing a bit of bass. My speaking voice, as you can hear, is quite low. Yes, it is. And the good news is that a low speaking voice often translates well into having a falsetto range that... Um, don't ask me about the science of it, but, uh, it's a, but it higher, does. a higher speaking, a higher tenorial voice, if you get a tenor to sing in their falsetto, their falsetto tends to be much higher anyway. So I discovered I could sing in my countertenor range kind of by accident. I was bored at school. We were singing something in a school chamber choir, and it came upon me, and I thought, that feels really nice. Um, so I went and explored it, and somebody said, it sounds all right. Um, and it, it was the first time when a spotlight came back on again which had gone off after my voice had broken. Um, and it suddenly felt special and different again. And that's really why I sing, because it, yeah, it makes you feel good inside. And the added bonus of making other people feel good by enjoying it is, you know, just a when privilege. When did you fall in love with opera? Late on, actually. I, I wasn't really interested or knowledgeable about opera itself till I was nearly in my last year at university. So I was about 20, 22. Um, Do you remember what it was? 
Yeah, I, I watched a specific production of a Handel opera um, which had been transmitted and put onto VHS in those days at uh, Glyndebourne Festival Opera in England, and it was um, the singer I, I look up to most, uh, countertenor Andreas Scholl, who I've sung with here at the Metropolitan Opera since. Um, and I'd, I'd bought his CDs, I'd listened to him sing, I'd sort of copied the way he sang, just to sort of get a feel of what it felt like. And I saw him in a Handel Opera and I thought, ah, so you can sing this stuff now, and then it opened a whole world, like mm -hmm. reading a book and you discover which authors they're influenced by, and then day by day I picked up all these other arias and things that I could sing. And then I went to London to do postgraduate at the Royal Academy of Music, and that's really where I thought, okay, a lot of this music is for me. The Metropolitan Opera. Yeah. What did you do there, as we show some uh, pictures, and why does it matter? Well, I've just been there singing in um, a contemporary opera, which was premiered here, uh, called The Exterminating Angel by... The Exterminating Angel. Angel. Yeah, which is based on the uh, Bunuel film. Mm. And um, surrealist piece. Uh, Thomas Adders, the great British composer, has... Uh, he's had another opera performed here, The Tempest, a few years ago, which I was oh, yeah. in as well. And, uh, but it was a, this was a great success here. Um, and I think it surprised a lot of people because you think of the Met, you think of Bohème and Tosca and great Zeffirelli productions and um, an audience in a way who know what they're going to go and see. And here we are throwing them 15 principles trapped on stage and in a <laughs> dining room where they can't escape. It's not Puccini. It's not Puccini. And it got a great review in the New York Times from Tomasini, which really helps um, you know, convince people that it's a good thing yeah. to go and watch. And I think we had such different audiences from London where we did it and such different audiences from Salzburg. And it was Tuesday night audiences in New York are amazing. It was mm. a young crowd. A lot of young people came to see this. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah. Bring it back home to the play right now that uh, is playing through March, uh, Farinelli and the King. Describe mm. it. It's a play um, based on a true story. Farinelli was one of these castrati I was talking about. Mm. He was the most famous singer of the day. In terms of today, <clears throat> he was like a film star, like a, a football star, whatever. And the King of Spain, Philip V, this is around the late 1730s, was going mad. And they decided to uh, experiment with what we would call music therapy. So they called on Farinelli to come from London where he was performing and sing to the king and see whether it had an effect on the king's emotional state. And to all intents and purposes, Who it plays the did. King? The king is played by a very unknown actor called Mark Rylance. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's small bad. fry. Well, yeah, he's, he's, um, yeah, he does mad very, uh, very can well. Can we show a shot if we could, Georgia? Uh, um, and of the king. Farinelli, stayed, Farinelli stayed there with the king for the rest of his life and for a further 10 years, and became um, a fixture at the Spanish monarchy. Opera, Broadway. Give me some adjectives that describe the different... I see your head go like this right away. I know. It's incredible. It's such a privilege for me to be able to do both of them in the same season and to do Broadway at all. To be in a play is... I've always dreamt of being an actor, of being in, a, being in that situation, rather than necessarily being a singer. So I get the best of both worlds. Um, it's completely different. For a start, we do eight shows a week. Uh, of which I'm doing six, just so I can survive. You've got to say that voice. I've got to say that voice. We're not amplified at all. You know, You're know, you not? No, not at all. The, and all the actors, everybody, we're all unamplified. And this is why we, you know, we, we make sure we're in the right theatre for the acoustics. We make sure that, you know, I don't do eight shows a week. And Mark Rylance, of course, ran the Globe Theatre in London, which relies totally on natural light and natural sound. And so he takes that into all his work, and it's... It's a really, really fascinating thing to work with actors and see how they can change one line, one word, and change the whole reaction of an audience. But you only get to see that when you do week upon week of shows. With an opera, we might do seven shows total. And so we never really get to see that mm. effect you have. By the way, I'm, I'm in the play right now, Farinelli and the King, some of the audience actually sits on the stage, or do I have that wrong? Yeah, no, they do. We have this great um, setup where the stage itself is a copy of the Sam Wanamaker Theatre in London. So it's essentially um, uh, the theatre that Inigo Jones planned to build but never built, and which they built in London recently. So we have uh, the two doors at the back where the actors enter and exit, and one in the centre, and then two rows of boxes either side. So it's really Shakespearean, it's really mm. sort of early 17th century. Everybody's right in the thick of it. And you'd think, you know, we don't want to be on stage, you can't see anything, but actually you're, you're part of the action. And if you're lucky enough, Mark might break the fourth wall and 
and bring you into it. Um, you that's you the love, exciting thing about it. You love what you do. I absolutely adore what I do, especially right now, because I feel that in this play, the pressure's off me for once. Usually in opera, it's all about the singers, and this, it's about the music, and it's, it's about the actors. And so I just get to watch and sing. We wish you and your colleagues in, uh, over at Farinelli and the King over at the Belasco Theatre, 111 West 44th Street, um, nothing but the best. Thank you. Thanks so much. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We're pleased to welcome our good friend Ken Kirsten, former editor, New York Observer. He's so much more than that. He is someone who understands politics, media, and um, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Steve. Ken, by the way, to describe for those who don't have a sense of the New York Observer, its place in the media landscape in this region. Well, I probably have an outsized view of its place and importance, but... Uh, the Observer is famous for punching above its weight. You know, it was founded about 30 years ago um, to sort of be, they often described it when uh, the Wall Street banker, Arthur Carter, who founded it as the, the college newspaper of the Upper East Side. Mm. Um, but it, it grew way beyond that. And while the five years I was editor, it actually grew to a national publication. Right. And uh, because our uh, publisher and owner at the time was the son-in-law of this guy running for president. Um, Jared it, Kushner. It, yeah, that's exactly right. It, its influence and uh, uh, intrigue were uh, beyond anything they had experienced prior to that. You know, I told Ken right before we started the program that we, we always disclose when we're taping. We're taping during the holidays in uh, 2017. There are so many things happening and changing around us every minute. Forget about every day. Quick description of Jared as a person. Jared was, uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll give you a description of Jared Kushner as a publisher first, all right? Um, he never got the credit he deserved, in my opinion, for, for what an excellent publisher he is. And as you're seeing now, the, the media experienced this, like, unprecedented wave of, of breakdowns where it's, it's under constant assault of being fake news on the one hand, and on the other hand, there, there really is these, you know, these evidences of, of extreme uh, bias and misbehavior and, and all kinds of bad contact. I just felt that, that Jared uh, paid a lot of money to run this thing, almost always let us do what we thought was best. And when, you know, when he had an opinion, he, he lobbed it in there, mm. sometimes forcefully, but, but never was heavy-handed. And even the, the people who worked for him, the editors, uh, my predecessors uh, who, who weren't uh, personal friends with, with him, as I have been, um, you know, they, they, they can attack his politics, they can, they can attack mm. his... Um, you know, the fact that he's serving in the government now, but they, they really haven't been able to lay a glove on him as far as uh, integrity goes. So, so, so let, let's, I'm always fascinated by your thoughts on bigger picture questions like the relationship between the media, not a monolithic entity, including those of us in public broadcast, uh, and the president in this White House as we do this program. This whole fake news thing that you just put out there right now, which the president talks about a lot, you believe in that there is a, consistent pattern of so-called fake news, which some of us often believe is those of us who raise questions challenge the White House as we would anyone. Would you, you actually think there's this thing called fake news across the board? Absolutely. I believe, the that, the, I believe that the mainstream media has such a, a profound and pervasive hatred, and I use that word advisedly. Strong it's, word. it's an emotional reaction to this president to the point where they, they believe uh, as a whole, that something went wrong during the 2016 election and the, the smart people didn't get the candidate that, that they thought was supposed to win, that, that they believe that it's their job um, as, as citizens and as uh, smart people and, and better people than the people who, who voted for this candidate to, to sort of correct this, this mistake. Ken, excuse me, move, move beyond the campaign and talk about the governing process. To what degree do you feel that President Trump contributes to the adversarial, unhealthy adversarial relationship with the media by calling people out by name, by actually calling them names, by saying what is put out is fake news, and in fact, disrespecting the media and telling his audience publicly they are the enemy. Do you think that that's presidential in any way? Or you're a student of leadership, and one of my favorite books of all time is the book you wrote with Rudy Giuliani on leadership. Is that leadership? President Trump is definitely pours gasoline on the fire. There's no okay. doubt about it. He's an Has incendiary. It he's an incendiary person. Whether it's helped or not, I, I do think he's played a role in exposing something that was sort of bubbling beneath the surface 
and, and corrosive to a democracy, which is that the, the media thinks that its opinions and its, its uh, viewpoints are more important and more valid than those of the average uh, citizen. They, they, by and large, do not cover the news objectively. They cover it with an injection of how they think the world ought to look. And that, that might be fine if those viewpoints were, were more diverse and uh, ideologically diverse than they are. But a staggering number of these people, many of whom I love and hire, and you're my Facebook friend, you see them yep. comment all the time on my Facebook, but a staggering number of them agree with, with each other on everything. It's, it's stunning to me how uniform the opinion of these uh, so-called nonconformists is. But take out the question, the, the, the opinion part, because some of us are not opinion journalists, and if we are, in fact, expressing our opinion, we do it as analysts or commentators, but in public broadcasting, it's not my place to, and you know that. We've been together a long time. We talked about this. But just the raising of the questions, the challenging of information put out by the White House, you see that as adversarial in an unhealthy way. I'm, I'm fascinated by that because in my interpretation of the Constitution is that that's exactly our role. Do you distinguish that from opinion media? So I, I'll, I'll give you a good example. And this sure. may be obsolete by the time this broadcast, but uh, just a week ago when Brian Ross got on ABC, ABC News. Literally right across it, the street um, from us. I'm looking here. at it as I talk to you. It's over your, your right shoulder. That's here. right. Um, Brian Ross got on and said that as a candidate, President Trump ordered General Flynn uh, to make contact with Russia. Not true. Incredibly incendiary charge. It took them five hours to correct it. They didn't correct it till late on a Friday night. And then when they finally did, they blamed Brian Ross rather than uh, fixing the, the system. But what I'm telling you, Steve, is that the reason a mistake like that gets on is not because mistakes happen, as they always have they throughout do. media. It's not that. It's because of this presupposition that somehow this election was couldn't be explained through any means other than, well, it had to be a foreign entity. It had to be a foreign power. So even as we've gone through you know, a year now of examining this and, and uh, Robert Mueller starting to, mm. to uh, get indictments and starting to put... Uh, and we don't know how things are going to play yeah, out. We have so no right. idea by the time this airs. But for a year, none of this has anything to do with the campaign colluding with Russia. All of that has been a year of of you know, w running on a treadmill. So what a, what, 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 let me make this ahead. point, that where I think that sure. that's bad for democracy, whether you like Trump and support him or whether you hate Not him. Not even the issue for a lot all, of us. All of these other issues, he's appointing a record number of judges, record numbers of regulation are falling by the wayside. And you are All these actions his. going on. I, I do support Trump. Uh, the no, president, not just support him. him. From, forget about the politics. As a leader, you believe Trump, President Trump, excuse me, has strong leadership qualities including, dare I use the term, emotional intelligence combined with maturity. You believe that? I think President Trump has been way underestimated as a communicator um, and as an as a agent of change. And those are two important qualities. There are some, including some Twitter? elements. There are some elements of his leadership that I, I don't think are, uh, That's not are your where style, they should Ken. be. I don't think that he's a perfect leader, um, but I think he's a strong leader. Um, and I, I think he's a way underestimated leader, and that, that has been the secret to his appeal the whole time. When he was a, in a field of 17 candidates... No doubt as a candidate. Um, he was... It, it, he benefited constantly from being underestimated. Real quick, but on the governing side, the use of Twitter, and again, it's not even about this tweet or that tweet, because we'll date ourselves, but the use of Twitter and the way he uses it as president, not as a candidate, you don't see in any way as a leadership problem in terms of focusing on what's important versus creating unnecessary fights, arguments, yeah, well, diversions. Well, it was like when, when Barack Obama signed up for Twitter and sent his first tweet, it was cause for great celebration of, of, of the, the great young leader embracing this new technology. Sure. And here's Donald Trump, who has mastered the format, who's, who's way you older than, than Obama, mastered the format, absolutely. That's, that's beyond a, a doubt. Whether he uses it to, to someone's liking is, is arguable. But you can't deny the influence he's had. The use of uh, it. The, the use of it. it. Why is that such a problem? I, I don't get it. He communicates directly as a way to get around the, the filters, the, the, you know, the TV hosts. Without trying to predict, sorry for interrupting again, without trying to predict how things are going to play out, and I'm not, we're not going to do the Russia thing or anything else, I, we don't know. The relationship between the White House and, I'm not going to say the press corps, but all of us in the media, what, if anything, do you believe could or should happen, needs to happen to improve that relationship, if anything? Yeah, that, that relationship is really badly damaged, and I, I think it, it, some of the personal feuds that, that have uh, 
erupted um, between not just the president but different spokespeople, um, I, I don't think they're helpful to advance in the democracy. And I, th I do think the president shares some of the, the blame there. I, I don't understand the need to personalize um, these fights. But uh, I think the media has, has consistently underestimated this president, has consistently uh, tried to undermine him to the detriment of this country, mm -hmm. and has gotten things wrong way more than they should have because of their view that he doesn't know what he's doing. Final question, the future for Ken Kirsten is? <laughs> You've been talking about spending some more time with your family, which is, as a your Facebook friend, I see that, and it's absolutely beautiful. Anything else you're thinking about professionally? Well, my, my big obsession right now is, is cryptocurrency and the way the blockchain in, in particular is go just going to change everything. I, I think it's going to come to redefine money and even uh, what, what being a nation means. So I'm spending a lot of my time uh, focused on cryptocurrency and helping businesses understand the blockchain. You know what? Thank you. Thanks as so always, much, my friend. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Be right back right after this. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Steve Adubato here at the Liberty Science Center. This is an extraordinary night. It is the, um, the annual gala of the New Jersey Sharing Network celebrating 30 years. Elise uh, Glennon, who everyone knows, or Chiron will be up. And she is a partner of ours in public broadcasting, and you've been a leader in this organization. But 2016 was an extraordinary year in terms of saving lives. Talk about it. Yes, last year we saved more lives than we ever had before. Uh, and this year we're continuing on that same track. And it's, you know, because of so many things, because of all the people here, because of the programming that you do, and because of the strong and continued support of the entire community. Let's talk about this 30th anniversary. I mean, one of the things that we try to do in public broadcasting um, and Fios and all of our partners, with all of our partners, is to be involved in quote unquote public education awareness, but at least make it clear what that really means because people think they know about organ and tissue donation, but what do they really need to understand? I think people need to understand that donating your organs and becoming an organ donor is a really special altruistic gift. And there are currently 120,000 people waiting for a life-saving transplant nationally. 4,000 of them live here in New Jersey. And it's so easy to save a life. You can register to be an organ donor at the motor vehicle or on your iPhone or at our website. Uh, it's a quick and easy thing. Um, and then the hard part is talking to your family about it. What do you mean? Really, really letting your family know what your wishes are. Let them know now so that uh, should the time come that you pass and, and there needs to be a decision made, uh, that your family feels comfortable and knows and understands your decision and your desire to save a life. Elise is making a great point because one of the um, one of the parents we're going to speak to tonight, a survivor, if you will, of a young man who lost his life, but who gave, I believe he helped 70 people, if I'm not mistaken. But the point I'm making is this young man made it clear as to what his wishes were and checked off the box, if you will, on his license. Yeah, you know, when, when your loved one dies in, in an unexpected way, there, there's so much going on in your, in your mind. Uh, so many decisions to make, end-of-life decisions. And when you know um, this decision about your loved one, especially if it's your child, your son, your daughter, uh, and you know that this is what they would want to do, they would want to save someone else's life in their passing, it takes one little burden off um, at that time. And then, of course, you get to live knowing that your loved one has left a legacy and that their life will indeed go on through someone else. Well, tonight, as I said, celebrates the 30 years of this um, very important organization. Talk about the future, the challenges, and the opportunities uh, the Sharing Network faces. You know, when you, when you think about other organizations, they've been around for 50, 100 years. We're still so young. We are o we've only been around 30 years. Organ donation and transplant is still so new and so young. There's so much opportunity in the future through um, research in our lab, through educating more people to say yes to donation, through so many potential medical advances to save more and more lives. What do you mean medical advances? Well, um, you know, when organ donation started 30 years ago, it was kidney to kidney, twin to twin, and now anybody can donate to anybody. Pretty much. I mean, there's obviously matching that goes on with it, but you don't have to be a relative. You don't have you to don't. be a twin. No, you do not. Um, you know, and, and just in recent years, we've seen hand transplants. We've seen face transplants. There's always something going on to, to further transplant and save and help more people. 
And we want to be part of that, and we will be part of that, especially with this community of support around us, um, donating their money, donating their time, getting involved with us philanthropically, giving us the resources to really move forward. Please, finally, I've asked you this question in so many settings, publicly, privately, but I want to give you an opportunity to talk to folks again about the greatest personal reward and satisfaction you get out of this initiative and your work with it. It is truly an honor and privilege to do this work. Um, every day when I come to the office and I look at the faces of our staff, the staff that's out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, caring for families, that's primarily what they do. They care for families who've just lost someone, and of course then they care for the families who've received the gift of life. And it, I don't have a specific story for you because- There's so many. There's so many, um, and they're all equally as moving, and we'll see that tonight during the program as well. Congratulations. Thank you, Steve. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Investors Bank, Seton Hall University, PSENG, Hackensack Meridian Health, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, and by the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Perfectly orchestrated, in sync with your life. Hackensack Meridian Health is redefining how health and care come together. Because when everything works together, your world gets better. Hackensack Meridian Health, life years ahead.